You're listening to the Hour of History podcast with your hosts Stephen Bauman and Matthias Fueling and producer James Abel. The Hour of History podcast aims to understand how we know what we know and why the past matters. Without further delay, your Hour of History begins right now. Hello and welcome to Hour of History. I'm Stephen Bauman and this week I, it's a special treat for Hour of History because we have a special guest. Um, sitting in for Matthias and and it's going to bring a new insight into a different topic. So today I'm here with Monika Dirksen and she's going to talk a little bit about her research on policing in Philadelphia in the 1970s. So um, without further ado, hi Monika and welcome. Um, why don't you introduce yourself? Who are you and, and what do you study? Hi, Stephen. I'm a PhD student at Temple, and I'm focusing on the relationship between the police, specifically in Philadelphia and the black community in the 1970s. And I'm looking at race relations, how did racial tension arise between the two groups, and what can be done to solve it, since policing in America today is a major issue. Yes, I'd say. Um, I typically study world history and world perspectives and and you know police are obviously an issue there too but it seems like in the united states that uh, police incidents are usually in the news or at least seem to be regularly in the news um is that what brought you to studying that for history like w w what brought sparked this interest well my current interest is in post-1968 urban cities, U.S. history, and the main reason why I decided to look at policing and police brutality cases in Philadelphia is because one, I live in Philadelphia, and two, I've noticed since 2012 that there have been many shootings between the police and African American males, and I wanted to know, are the police really using, are they corrupt, or are they using excessive force, or is it suspects that are highly dangerous as to why police are using this force often deadly force awesome. yeah so um it anytime a lot of people are dying or like violence is happening in the street especially when there's a connection to your hometown like these are things that not only interest historians but interest the community and in the fact that you're researching from 1968 to the present, but uh, so for people who aren't familiar with modern history or modern U.S. or even modern Philadelphia, what is special about 1968 or after 1968? Why, why would you start there? Well, a lot of people believe that with the civil rights movement ending in 1968, there was mass, in, mass equality between whites and blacks. And that's not actually the case. The case is that the civil rights movement benefited middle-class blacks with education, with jobs, with voting rights, and poor and, lo and lower-class African-Americans often struggled in inner cities, urban cities, especially with white flight from the 1950s into the 70s, and with jobs leaving, so job flight, especially with outsourcing by private employers and cities becoming desolate and losing factory jobs and the tax bases of many governments, specifically when I'm looking at Philadelphia, has dropped because of specifically job flight, white flight, and people just taking their tax dollars to other suburban neighborhoods. And, and this is a phenomenon that we see happening after the civil rights era. So it, uh, and there's, this is like a well-established uh, time framing in the field. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the fact that it's in Philadelphia too. Um, so Philadelphia, right, has a long history with first of all American independence and you know independence hall is always posted on everything like that's a symbol of Philadelphia used to make so often that it makes people kind of sick 
um, you know, to get the tourist dollars in, but, but there's so much more to Philadelphia. And so I think that's kind of interesting that your research is, is looking at a part of Philadelphia that sometimes the Liberty Hall or whatever, you know, the sticker is pasted over this. Um, so I'm curious about a couple of things. Is Philadelphia representative, would you say, of like, um, of multiple urban areas post 1968? Is, is Philadelphia like super representative? Does it show even better maybe than other cities do? Um, if someone studies New York, would it be totally different? Kind of why Philadelphia? Yeah. So I chose Philadelphia because I was basically biased <laughs> and I wanted to focus on what I cared about, which city I was concerned with. And I would say that New York and Detroit and, and places in New Jersey, urban centers there, they're all a different case and they function differently with their mm. situation with race relations, economy, and whole social structure. So just focusing on Philadelphia is just a way to not only give Philadelphia more attention in the major historical narrative on policing in urban cities, but also to give me something that I care about mm -hmm. to the public. And as, as far as history, um, as far as history works, a lot of times, uh, and I have this, I've seen this in my own experience working with students of all ages, uh, a lot of times historians are given a curriculum to teach or a certain thing they have to teach and that's not always what the students are interested in because there is an uh, I guess something we all want to find out about the area we live in you know that makes sense or the area we grew up in that makes mm -hmm. sense to me um, so I think that's good that's a good place to start now um, so this is obviously a complex topic and you've spent a lot of time researching it and you're going to continue doing a lot of research on it. Uh, what I'm curious, again, so now we just lay the foundations before you tell us what you've actually read and stuff like that, but um, so the racial tensions, how do we define race? That's, I'm just gonna go out there and say it because I think it's uh, it's funny, again, when I'm teaching, a lot of students, like that's the one thing they won't talk about. You know, we could be talking about any conflict and you know, classes historians tend to focus on conflicts and, and wars and things like that. And it's everyone's so hesitant to even say race. And, and everyone, even if you're talking about the Civil War or something, like everyone knows that that's a factor but they don't say it so if, maybe if you could tell us what is race and and why are people so scared of talking about it <laughs> so race is a social construct so it's not a real thing like ethnicity so ethnicity is basically you're genetically tied to a certain group of people you share a certain culture while race is just a simplified version of grouping people. So let's say you have someone who's Irish, someone's Italian, someone's Czech, and in America we would use the racial term that they are white. That does not give them their specificity, their identity. It just lumps them into one clump and makes them so simplified that when we look at each other we just quickly group them and not consider their individuality. So is that, that's probably why people are uncomfortable about it. Like, because people want to be, you know, it's Snapchat era, right? <laughs> Everyone wants to have their own name and their own tag and whatever. Is that, is that, I mean, I guess that sounds like a good reason, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so when we're talking about police then, and we're talking about racial tensions, what is that describing? It's describing white officer, meaning Irish American or uh, Italian American. <laughs> Thanks for helping me out. And um, and then who's the what? What? Where's the tension with the citizen of Philadelphia? Presumably, <laughs> someone who's non-white, or are they white as well? Well, in the seventies, tension between white cops and and in, there were a few cases where black cops committed excessive force against suspects, but specifically white cops versus African Americans. In the 70s, there were 469 police-involved shootings, and out of that number, 
66% of the people that were shot or killed by the police were black. And mind you that during the 70s, the African-American population in Philadelphia was 33%. So right there, you can see that there is some sort of racial bias in how people are policed in Philadelphia during that time. And even today, with the issue of stop and frisk and just seeing how there are more arrests and higher sentences for African Americans versus white Americans, you see that there is a bias. Either it's institutionally created or it's something in the mentality of some officers, but not all. So now you're working, you have these statistics or um, and then from those statistics, asking more questions, right? Historical research, why is this the case? Why does it continue to be the case? Um, and can you tell us a little bit about that, where, where you do your research, where you get the information, how the process works for people who are you know, uninformed about the historical process? Okay. So to do this kind of research, I would say first starting with newspaper articles. So I know that newspapers.com is a great source for finding modern newspapers. I found a bunch of articles about Frank Rizzo while he was police commissioner, while he was mayor of Philadelphia. I found articles about police involved shootings, cases in which African Americans shot and or killed the police. Their court trials were featured in newspapers. There are also Let's see, court dockets, so you can go online and access it from the court system's database and just search by name. So you would primarily have to look at newspapers first and then get the names and then go to the court dockets online. And then there's also town hall meetings. You would have to go to the archives. So for me, I prefer to go to Temple's Urban urban archives or the special collections and have them pull out the archivists pull out like newspaper articles or pictures anything that they have have saved relating to those cases so i imagine and those are all like uh basically public resource i guess some of them have to be come after a while but uh, so it sounds to me like that there was at least information about these, you know, 469 killings. Like those are out there. It's out, it was out there at the time. Um, what was the reaction like when people because it, uh, so I read in the paper, you know, and I don't know what was happening in 1970s Philadelphia, but I presume people were going about their daily lives just like today, you know, concerned with. Uh, say a lot of the same international issues concerned with sports concerned with whatever the heck they do every day but there are also these articles are they front page news what is the reaction at the time so oftentimes if it was a major case of police involved shooting or a suspect killing a police it was front page news for example there's one case that um, I focus on a lot it's the um, shooting of patrolman John Trenton in February 1976, he was shot and killed at a housing project in Southwest Philadelphia by a, a black teenager who was angry at police because of the fact that his friend six months ago was shot excessively after he robbed a supermarket to get money for his family. So that case was in the newspaper's front page for, for weeks to months until the teenager was sentenced for his crime. So, so this is a case that uh, it, it really sh highlights attention from both sides. It shows, it gripped the imagination at least of Philadelphia. And so it gives you a, sort of an opportunity to look into those things. Yeah, so can you yeah. tell us more? <laughs> so just looking at that case you see that there's like a cycle of violence in which when the police use excessive force or deadly force against a suspect specifically African American there's a response even if it's negative it it can be with shooting against the police attacking the police with a knife or a bottle or anything and it could lead to death and it just shows that because that tension and it's often racial 
because it's often between a white cop and a black suspect. It just continues, and if it's not solved, like in community centers or with talks between police and community members, it continues. So can we just, so we're clear before we go forward, like give, what is an example of excessive force that a policeman or policewoman in the 1970s might use? Okay, so for example, there's a Pennsylvania law that says that a police officer is allowed to use force in apprehending a suspect, but they're not allowed to use deadly force unless their life is threatened. So if a police officer decides to shoot a fleeing suspect, the suspect has to have committed a forcible felony, which is like rape, um, armed robbery, kidnapping, and if the suspect is fleeing, the officer is allowed to shoot, it's even especially if the suspect may have committed murder. That's another forcible felony. So if the suspect committed any of those things, the officer can shoot him without getting in trouble because that person, that suspect, is a danger to society because of the crime that he allegedly already committed. Now, if a suspect is not known to have committed a forcible felony, then the officer does not have a right to shoot with deadly force at a suspect. So if a suspect is fleeing an officer, the officer does not have a right to shoot him in the back. So, wow. I mean, that's a lot of decision making that an officer <laughs> has to make pretty quick there in, yeah. and life and death situation. And that's a Pennsylvania law that still exists or yes. is this only in the net? Wow. And this still exists, and, and okay, and the similar laws probably exist from state to state. Yes. With with slight variations. Um, okay, so that's that could create a excessive force, right? Yes. And um, you've done a little bit about the training of the officers too. So what might it, like how would an officer's training be in, in case of force? Yeah, I'm sure it varied from time to time, but. Yeah. So they're supposed to use their judgment and they're get, they get training in weapons, they get training in state laws, and they also get training in let's see how to, they also do like emergency services. So there's some training in that. But many of the officers, they are former, when well the 70s, they were Vietnam veterans. So even though they were taught to use to use wise judgment in how they utilize force, some of them had PTSD s from the war, so they would sometimes react involuntarily or voluntarily use excessive force based on maybe past fears of being killed or knowing that feeling threatened. And you can also throw in racial bias, especially in Philadelphia when since the early 1900s, especially during 1940s, when formerly segregated neighborhoods became desegregated and blacks started to move into predominantly white neighborhoods, there was racial tension, there was rioting, there were police, white police who did not come to the aid of African Americans who were attacked by whites who did not want to live with them, did not want to go to school with them. So all of this experience of officers who worked in the 70s but lived in Philadelphia since the 40s, all of these memories and experiences can and have shaped some of the mindsets of officers that police predominantly black neighborhoods. And so again the police are sort of you know they're receiving their training they come from a variety of backgrounds but there's probably a significant amount who served in Vietnam I mean that would seem like a, a job to go to um, and then Philadelphia is also at least still experiencing pretty significant change that goes back to the 40s and even before that that sort of creates racial tensions so or at least that that's where the racial tensions happen is so where uh, that's I guess my question where are these tensions happening you say like so blacks are moving into neighborhoods and then that's creating tension why why is that creating tension <laughs> <laughs> so um 
post nineteen post eighteen sixty five there was de facto segregation, so there wasn't a law that made segregation legal in the North, but people were coaxed into living separately. And in some cases there were blacks and whites that lived together, but they often were both poor and worked the lowest level of jobs and lived in neighborhoods and areas like near dockyards and undesirable places, crowded streets. And and when African-Americans got the opportunity to move to better neighborhoods, like in the Northwest or like Germantown or Mount Airy, or they were able to move further up from Center City to like lower North Philly or, or upper North Philadelphia, like Nice Town. There was tension because whites who traditionally lived in those areas worked in factories in those areas. Many of them did not want to share that space. They didn't want to share their jobs, their schools, their neighborhoods with homes with African Americans based on social and racial stigmas that came from slavery. So there was often rioting between both groups. There was also home, black homes were often targeted for um, fire bombs, cross burnings, stonings, and all of this tension. Sometimes police were sent out to stop whites from rioting against blacks. But oftentimes police would arrest the black people and not the white people. So that early disgrace and betrayal basically caused many African Americans to distrust the police. In addition to police citywide being known in some cases for dealing in corruption with facilitating um, drugs or prostitution or just letting it go by in society or taking bribes from criminals in neighborhoods that they police. So all of these factors, not just police brutality, police corruption, but police not being on the side of African Americans who were not criminals, who needed help, caused mistrust between police and black people. So, and in that in the atmosphere of mistrust, can you also talk a little bit about, and I know they've factored into your research, the African Americans in the police force. Um, how were they viewed in, in African American communities and how, what challenges do they face in the police force? Okay. So African Americans, there have been African Americans in Philadelphia's police force since the late 19, the late 1800s. And in the 1960s when Frank Rizzo was police commissioner he encouraged and facilitated more African Americans to be to join the police force so many times in the 60s there was a black cop and a white cop that were patrolling neighborhoods and for black cops knowing that there's a history of racial tension between white police and black people, many black people mistrusted, well, we'll say some, some black people mistrusted black cops because they saw it as a betrayal that they're working for a white, supposedly white system that is racially biased against black people. So they felt, so black people felt betrayed by black cops in some cases and then on the other hand black cops also face discrimination in the police force for just being black and working around some whites who held racial prejudice so did the police like so these tensions are obvious there's a lot of killing going on like ideally people want to live in a peaceful city everyone does so what what is the police reaction to this kind of thing? Are the police making um, outreach efforts in order to get rid of this uh, image they have as the, of not being trusted? Or are they comfortable in not being trusted and do they just stick to their um, districts? How are the police reacting to this sort of like, it sounds pretty apparent mistrust between uh, communities within the same city? Okay, so 
the police and the city government have tried since the 60s to fix the relationship between the police and the black community, but oftentimes certain officials in government like Frank Rizzo, um, just to pick on him, he often betrayed that trust. He, as commissioner, he was known to use racial slurs and use police brutality against protesters. For example, with the protest at Girard College in the 60s where African Americans wanted Girard College to be desegregated. Frank Rizzo was known to have beat protesters and he encouraged officers to break up the protests with beating. And in addition to that, Frank Rizzo, he, in his speeches and press conferences, he oftentimes, when there was a police involved shooting or a suspect, a black suspect that killed a police officer, he would take the side of the officer over the suspect without even knowing all the facts. And with that being publicized over the airwaves and on TV screens, it sent a message that police and their lives matter more than citizens, specifically stigmatized people like African Americans or just in general criminals. But there were cases in which police involved shootings that led to the death of suspects. They were police officers were prosecuted, but most of the time the police officers were acquitted of murder. And there were also cases in which community centers like police athletic leagues, cops would mentor African American children, not just African American children, but all children in Philadelphia who joined PAL centers. So there were opportunities for police and African Americans and other community members to fix the issues that they had between them. But it was always tense. And the 70s is important because it was that decade in which the most officers since the 1920s were killed in Philadelphia, which was 17. And in Phil and in with African Americans suspects who were killed, it was at its highest with four hundred and sixty nine police involved shootings. So, so the seventies is the high point. Are the police athletic leagues in response to the killings? Do those exist before or and do those still exist? Well, they existed before the seventies, and they would have different sports for children, drumming, they had basketball, um, wrestling. They also, in one summer in, in the 1970s, provided lunch for African-Americans, children, and there are many PAL centers in Philadelphia today. I think there's about 54, but not many children in the city are members of PAL centers. So it's up to the city of Philadelphia to make more of an initiative of getting children involved with events with police. There's also police who take the police departments, well not police departments, but police districts that take the initiative and hold block parties. They play basketball games with neighborhood children. They themselves organize it and reach out to the community, go to the schools and talk to the children or go Christmas shopping with them just to build a connection knowing that in many of these neighborhoods there's a high rate of violence between both groups. Yeah, so that that sounds like a positive step at least towards making relations better, but um, you've mentioned him a couple times now too. I think we should talk more about like sort of the obstacles to some of these positive things and um, and for people who don't know Philadelphia, Frank Rizzo is a huge uh, part of Philadelphia history. Um, and certainly he's come under fire recently with the statue in the center of Philadelphia. There's a larger than life statue of him. And um, 
Yeah, so so let's and that's been taken down or it's going to be taken down. It will be taken it down. It will be taken down. The city decided or they how did did it come about as a city thing? I don't recall. <laughs> well, um the former mayor um Ed Rendell, he was encouraged by family and other supporters of Frank Rizzo to create have the statue placed in by City Hall. So it's in front of the Municipal Services Building downtown at is it 15th and... It's right there in the center, right? Yeah. Yeah. Basically City Hall. And... And he... Ed Rendell, he didn't have a true opinion of the statue. He just wanted to basically appease the citizens that petitioned for the statue to be there because... Rizzo being the first Italian-American police commissioner in Philadelphia, the first Italian-American mayor, he was seen by the Italian-American community in Philadelphia as a hero because he overcome many obstacles, his parents being immigrants from southern Italy and being raised in the lower part of South Philly and working hard and just being a hero to South Philadelphians. He was, his statue was placed there, but. Well, so when you put it that way, he sounds like a good guy that deserves a statue, but there's gotta be more to the story. Than he <laughs> <laughs> so because of all the talk of statues, Confederate statues being taken down and removed because they're symbols of racism throughout the South and the North, Lately, people have been bringing up the racism that Rizzo enacted on African Americans, on homosexuals, on vagrants, and that has caused many Philadelphians to have town hall meetings, petition the mayor, Mayor Kenny, James Kenny, to have the statue removed. And Kenny himself said in a event at Temple that he doesn't want the statue, he would prefer it be taken down, and he was he's willing to do what citizens want with it, and he's going to have a town meeting, but it was decided that they're going to move it anyway. So this is a, a popular movement um, of people who are clearly with knowledge of uh, Rizzo having, or at least creating, racial tension. So. Um, you can already see these tensions ha didn't magically disappear after the 1970s and continue on to today, but at least with the historical figures, um, what, can you tell us the, the other background of Rizzo? So we know so far that he was the story that earned him the statue when he was being sort of uh, put up as, as an ideal for the citizen of Philadelphia, I guess. But at the same time, you've mentioned him in a couple of conversations about the um, about excessive force and about putting down the protesters at Girard College. Uh, so what is his background and how does he factor into your research about this racial tension? So Rizzo, as a person, he was born to two Italian to a, his father, who was an Italian immigrant, and his father was in the military did a few years of service his father was also a beat cop in philadelphia in south philly and rizzo himself admired his father he always wanted to please his father but rizzo's father preferred his younger son rizzo's brother over him so there's an idea that circulates that frank rizzo wanting to be um, admired by his father, went into the military just like him, became a cop like him, and did what he could to rise above the bias system that was in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Police Department in the 40s in which Anglo-Saxon whites dominated major, pos major positions in government and the police force and Next on down the line were Irish Americans in Philadelphia got the next 
best opportunities at being in the police force and in city government. And then Italian Americans like Rizzo had to work their way up. They had to fall, fall in line with the ideas of Anglo-Saxon and Irish policemen that often use racial bias when they police neighborhoods. So Frank Rizzo was successful in that he was able able to navigate getting navigate meeting the need, meeting the ideas that Irish and Anglo-Saxon American police did followed and abided by in their politics at that time and in addition to that he got their their support and he was promoted all the way up to police commissioner so he did what he was the first Italian American to do that so that is why many people respect him but they choose to ignore the abuses that he committed which were somewhat influenced by how Irish, some Irish American police officers, you violence that they use to police neighborhoods. So this is yeah, and this is kind of something that historians, um, you know, historians are are kind of like critic. Well, not criticized for, but it, it's what we do. There's a there's a funny comic that shows someone dying, and uh, someone asks, "Is there a doctor here?" Mm -hmm. And then the someone turns around and he says, "I'm a doctor." And she says, "Well, can you help him?" And the doctor says, "No, I just criticize people because that's what historians do: is add complexity to these sort of figures that otherwise are being um, misrepresented or misunderstood, or even creating more." Uh, problems than I guess the intention is so it's interesting when you take a character like Frank Rizzo who you know is a well-known name in Philadelphia and and who are memorialized with statues and things like this historical memory is being created around these people who have much more to their story um, so I think that's interesting how you take him and put him in, or he, how he, I guess he pops up. You're not manipulating him, you know, he's there. He's there in this story and he's there in a big way. And at the same time, it's a good person to look at how it impacts various areas of Philadelphia with a large reach as the commissioner and mayor. Um, okay, so I think I have a good uh, foundation and basis about these 1970s. Is there, um, are there any like accounts or any um, any sort of research stories that you've come across that sort of represent what's happened in the 70s that kind of show us uh, what this looks like or just interesting stories because one of my favorite things to do when I'm in the archives is find these excellent stories and you know I research the Holocaust and a lot of times I, I just get lost in the stories and the hardest part really is uh, is choosing which story to tell <laughs> and, and I know that could be um, something that you face too so is, is there any representative story maybe well, when I did my research a few months ago, I came with the theory that it was just African American males that were being excessively policed and receiving excessive force and deadly force from police officers in Philadelphia. And just looking at town hall meeting transcripts, I realized that it's not just African American males, it's that were poor, that lived near housing projects. It was just also middle-class black people who happened to live in a predominantly white neighborhood. So there's a case story that I saw in around 1970, 1971, in which a doctor named Raymond Ragland, he was a pharmacologist. He lived in Mount Airy. He was a middle-class black man and he went to he, went, he was trying to go to the corner store around midnight and the police stopped him, accused him of being a criminal that they were looking for. They manhandled him. They pinned him up against a, a car right across the street from where his child went to school. And they took him to the police station. They questioned him. They threatened him. They initially charged him with resisting arrest. And because Dr. Raglan knew someone in the police department, he was 
cleared of the charges and freed, but he was still humiliated. He still has that mark on his record. And then there were other cases in which I saw that Latinx middle class and lower class people were also over policed. For example, there was a Puerto Rican man, a working class man, who was falsely arrested in North Philadelphia when police were supposedly to break up a fight between a white teen and a Puerto Rican youth. They arrested this man who was a father trying to walk his two children home to his mother's house and he spent the night in a police in a in a in a police a police district jail and although and also since he didn't speak english it further exacerbated the situation in which he was detained for 17 hours he didn't get a drink of water he couldn't make a phone call to his family and he also when his when he was cleared of any crimes he was complaining about how he had a mark on his record that can never be removed for something he didn't do so um if so yeah so in the case of dr ragland um i well i think it's kind of representative and also uh, well, one thing that I hear often is, so why don't African Americans just trust the police? You know, th this is something that comes up in the news and like Fox and Friends, it'll be on there. Like, the, you know, the police are there to protect and serve. And and this Dr. Ragland, you know, okay, he had a bad experience, but why doesn't he trust it? But when you read the account and like, so this is a man that's that was really doing nothing at all and being... What what reason did the police give for arresting him? They claimed that they were looking for a suspect and he matched... They claimed he matched the suspect's description, but it was untrue. They probably could not find the original suspect, so they found someone who could fit the description, but not perfectly. And when I looked at some court dockets, I noticed that there was a man that had a similar name, name to Raymond Ragland, who was also African-American. But if you take him to the police station and you know that he wasn't wearing the same clothes as the suspect and he's in a different neighborhood and he lives in that neighborhood and can find neighbors to attest to it, then it's corruption. They just wanted to make an arrest to prove that they somewhat did their job even if it's not the right person right and then you just think like uh in dr raglan's case and in the other case a 17 hour detention like these are kind of things that if someone does that to you <laughs> um you're not just going to be like oh okay these are good people just trying to help and it was an honest mistake i mean these are significant errors and these aren't errors that you know result mm -hmm. in the loss of life which yeah. also happens so um that's that's a pretty hard thing to overcome and i would think um that this kind of thing uh so like how i don't know if in this case you can follow up on dr raglan but what does an event like that or a certain uh something like that happening what does that do to the community how does dr raglan talk to his children about that or how do you know how how does that what are the ripple effects of this thing going forward well just assuming i would say that dr raglan well he did sue the police department so his wife his children would know that and he would i would assume also that he would have some sort of ptsd from that whole experience and he would relate that or his children would see him express that around them and knowing what he experienced and knowing that he was innocent would force them to remember how the police treated his their father so they would eventually turn and turn tell their friends their family members their future children what happened to their relative their father and that story, those stories would circulate. And that's what creates mistrust. And yeah, and that's, and that's apparent. And just the way, I mean, the, the, the way people talk about any interaction with the police, you know, um, and 
it, it does have ripple effects and it continues to impact communities for a long time. Now, you said you're bringing, or your goal is to sort of bring it, this research into the present and clearly there's still tensions. Um, I remember when I had a student in, in Brooklyn, uh, he was just walking, he was walking home from school and the police, you know, stopped him because of the same reason. He matched a sub suspect description. Now this was a high school student, so he was 15 years old, you know, he would, he, and by all senses of the word, a child, but he was in a grown man's body. You know, mm -hmm. he was a fully developed young male and, um, and like that was just, that was just something that's going to happen to him. So how, and this is also in the era of stop and frisk in New York, which is no longer a, a thing, but it was big at that time. So um, how then in the present do we make these r racial tensions and excessive force, like what are the steps that the police and the city and the communities can take? Well, just to be open, I would say that first I do trust the police, but just doing this research, I realized that many police officers can be corrupt. They do use excessive force, and many of them somehow prioritize their lives over the lives of others. And some police officers consider some people, either they, they're poor, this has nothing to do with race, but just being poor, there's a stigma that they're late, these type of people are lazy, they're criminal, they're not trustworthy. And then when you add on race, the stigmas and stereotypes associated with certain racial groups, it makes, a, creates a mindset and a mentality that it's okay to use excessive force because it's the only thing that will make that type of person stereotypically understand that you mean business. So, I mean, the first thing is that police need training. There needs to be less weapons training. I've heard that from different outlets. I've heard that police need more training in in the law so that they know what type of force is adequate when they confront suspects. I've also heard that um, going off of government funding, the government needs to provide more funding for like basically bulletproof vests and things that will make the officer feel safe because it's not just the citizen that needs to be safe, it's also the officer because the officer has his own life to worry about. He's not a superhero. He's not invincible. He has a family too. He's still a person. So his life does matter too. But if there are more... um things Im implemented in society to make them feel safe, but also know that no matter which person that they come in contact with, with that their life is valuable. So that training needs to be done. And, and so, I mean, that's a lot of clear steps that the officers can take and, or the city can take in, in instructing the officers. I've heard things like as, as, uh, simple as like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, you teach them a chokehold and you know, that's going to make the person black out, but it's not going to kill them rather than you see these horrific videos where the first thing they do is reach for the gun. Um, and as, as far as the community, uh, what, what, like, how does, how does someone in the community, if you hear these stories at home, like, I, how do how do you change that? Like as a community, what do you do? Because I know for a fact I've never just walked up to a, a police officer and said like, "How's your day going?" You know that would be weird. I would never do that. Um, I, I've known people who would give police officers like coffee and stuff, but I'm not even sure that that's not it. That's not a normal thing to do anymore. Maybe it was at one time. So what a, what does a community person do? Say there's someone in a community who wants to actively make a change for you know better Philadelphia. How do they make relations with the police officers better? I guess they could join like a community center, like a PAL center and engage with officers. They could invite officers to their home, I guess, make friends with them, invite them to community events, even if it's like informal events like block parties over the summer. 
They can invite them, have them be a presence with their uniform. I know that there's some officers that go into the their districts and let children play with the steering wheel of their car, police car, or hold their badge, wear their cap, and just interact with them, take pictures with them. And I mean, the other thing is that community members should not just assume, I know it might be hard, but they should not assume that all cops are bad and criminal and violent. They should change that narrative if they know of a cop that has been good and faithful to its citizens. So that means that people need to stop spreading false stories or incomplete stories with incomplete facts in schools and neighborhoods and churches and just public spaces and in homes too. You can't spread negativity about police and expect the police to respect you when you don't respect the police yourself. Yeah, this is one of the things that I uh, really appreciate about your research is that it looks at two different groups and it, you know, a lot of times when we're reading research, we're reading just this is this group and this is what happened. This is, and it could be anything, you know, political, cultural, whatever kind of history. It just because it's twice as much work when you're doing any sort of uh, double sided or comparative analysis. So I think that's really um, valuable as far as, you know, the practice of history goes. And then the other thing is that I think these are good lessons for not just police, you know, society could do this could you could say the same thing about teachers like tension between teachers and students and parents and teachers, you know, maybe the parents just don't know where the teachers coming from, or maybe the teacher hasn't taken time to sit down and have lunch with the parents. And it, the trouble to me is that we're in such a busy crazy world that you know people don't have time i remember when i was in boston and boston's not very popular in philadelphia now with the super bowl coming up <laughs> but i was in boston as a six-year-old and i smashed my thumb in a door at a bagel shop and i was just screaming and a police officer came up to me and let me sit in the front of his police car and that was the single like coolest thing i forgot all about smashing my thumb because he just took a little extra, you know, he could have gotten his bagel and been like annoying kid and then gone sat in his car, but instead he reached out to the community. So I think those are the kind of things that really um, have a long impact. So uh, is there anything else that you wanted to add about your research or that you have to say about the work that you've done or anything at all? Well, I just want my research to like inform people of like the origin original reasons for these racial tensions between the police and the black community. And I want to find solutions. I don't just want to like know the cause. I want to know what worked in the 70s so that we can figure out how to solve the police community issues in the present. So hopefully I'll be able to find something. Yeah, definitely important work. And um, we appreciate you joining Hour of History. This was a, a good uh, experience. And uh, that is your Hour of History. Thanks for listening. Thank you.